Okay, so today we're going to look through the Paper 4 Extended, which is a theory extended paper from May June 2018, and that's the CIE IGCSE, and this is Paper 41625, Paper 41 for Physics. All right, let's begin. One, figure 1, figure 1.1 shows the speed time graph for a vehicle accelerating from rest. A. Calculate the acceleration of this vehicle at time t equals 30 seconds. At time 30 seconds. Now acceleration is a change in speed over change in time. Which, well, technically, change in velocity over change in time. But this is a speed time graph we've been given. So we're looking for the gradient of the graph at time t equals 30 seconds. So what we need to do is draw a tangent line at t equals 30 seconds. So at t equals 30 seconds, we are looking at this time here, right in the centre, and of course, that's going to be all the way up here, oops, in between those, in the centre of that cube, there we are, so just where that crosses the line. We want to find the tangent to that, and the way we do that is we draw a straight line as flat as we can to the curve at that point. And there we go, that looks pretty perfect to me. That's a pretty good tangent. Now, what we have to do, of course, then, is just look at the two points where it ends. Two end points, and we'll label them. And point up top, here we go, this bit here, is 72, 30 point down at the base looks to be 0, comma, 4. There we are. That's it. Alright, so what we're going to do then, we're going to find change in speed divided by change in time. There we are. So, just write out there again, acceleration is change in speed divided by change in time. Let's put in the information we have. The speed is changing between 30 and 4, 30 minus 4, and the time is changing between 72 seconds and 0. We're going to want to calculate 26 divided by there we go, 72. And that gives us the value of 0 0.36 meters per second squared. 0 0.36 meters per second, negative 2. Now, a key point here. Remember the units. Very important. And also, remember, put down the equation you're using. All right. Excellent. Let's move on to B. Without further calculation, state how the acceleration at time t100 compares to the acceleration at time t equals 10. State, in terms of force, a reason why any change has taken place. All right. Let's look at the graph. t100 and t10. If I look at 10, there we go, just down the base here, it's very steep around that point. If I look all the way up at 100, it's much less steep. So here, we've got a large acceleration. And here, the acceleration is small. Nothing much smaller. Okay, so now we have to explain that. So, step number one. What's happened? Well, it's less. One possibility, of course, is that something moves faster as a larger amount of air resistance. And if the force from the engine remains constant, then the resultant force will decrease. Right. So the acceleration is less. At t equals 100 seconds. Why? Well, one possible explanation as speed increases, the force, due to air resistance, increases as well. And the resultant force is the force from the engine minus the force due to air resistance. So, there we go. 
as force due to ear resistance increases the resultant force decreases and acceleration also decreases. C. Determine the travel dist uh, the distance travelled by the vehicle between time t equals 120 seconds and t equals 160 seconds. Well, let's have a look at that. 120 and 160. Ah, here we go. It's this section at the end here, between this line and the other. Okay, and the key thing to know is to find distance travelled, it's the area under a speed time graph. So we're looking at those two areas. Area 1 and Area 2. In Area 1 is a triangle, it's 1 half times base times height, so base is 40 uh, seconds multiplied by the height of 10 metres per second. Area 2 is a rectangle, so just base times height, so we've got 40 seconds multiplied by a height of 20 metres per second. So it's worth three marks. So let's put down our key point. Distance travelled equals area under graph. There's likely going to be a mark for that. So that's going to be distance travelled area under graph, or that's area one plus area two. which is 20 meters per second times 40 seconds plus one half watts of 10 meters per second times 40 seconds. There we go. And that will give us a, an answer of 1,000 meters. There we go. And that's our answer. Make sure to put in the units. So we've got our explanation where it's coming from, we've got our calculation, we've got our answer and we've got the units wherever the three marks are there, we've got them. Two, figure 2.1 shows a forklift truck lifting a box. The electric motor that drives the lifting mechanism is powered by batteries. State the form of energy stored in batteries. Well, batteries are chemical potential energy or chemical energy. Both of those are acceptable. Right. The lifting mechanism raises a box of mass 32 kilograms through a vertical distance of 2.5 meters in 5.4 seconds. 1. Calculate the gravit gravitational potential energy gained by the box. Alright. Well, gravitational potential energy is mass times gravity times height. So let's write down the equation. And now we can put the numbers in from the question. We have mass, 32 kilograms, times gravity, 10 meters per second, negative 2, times the height of 2.5 meters, and that will give us a value of 800 joules. That's it, because this, of course, is energy. It's measured in joules. 2. The efficiency of the lifting mechanism is 0 0.65, which is 65%. Calculate the input power to the lifting mechanism. All right, it's so asking about input power here. Now, power equals work done divided by time. Okay, so let's see how much work is being done. Uh, we have 800 joules of work being done. And that's done in a time of 5.4 seconds. And that's 148 watts. Okay, now, if it was 100% efficient, that would be perfect. That would be everything. Instead, it's 65% efficient. So we need to calculate the total power in. All right, so the total power in equals useful power out divided by the efficiency. So 
So there we go. We have 148 watts divided by 0 0.65, which gives us 228 watts. Now, if I just look at the information I've got, here we go. Up here, so two significant figures, two significant figures, one significant figure. So that's probably only two significant figures there coming down. I'm going to maintain three significant figures in the calculation, but when I write down the final answer, because there's so many of them, which are two significant figures, and because one of the bits of information is only one significant figure for gravity, then I'm going to use two significant figures, so 200. 30 watts. The general rule is for significant figures either the same as the smallest number of significant figures in the calculation or one more. If I look at gravity that's only one significant figure there so I can do one or two significant figures I'm going to do two 230 watts. All right let's look at the next bit. C. The batteries are recharged from a mains voltage uh, that is generated in an oil-fired power station. By comparison with a wind farm, okay, state one advantage, one disadvantage of running a power station using oil. Well, okay, massive advantage, it's a reliable energy source, reliable energy input. What do we mean by that? It's always available. And one disadvantage? Well, they create CO2 and global warming, I guess. Another issue, of course. It's not renewable. There we go. Let's look at question number three. Three, a rectangular container has a base of dimensions 0 0.12 meters by 0 0.16 meters. The container is filled with a liquid. The mass of the liquid in the container is 4.8 kilograms. Calculate the weight of the liquid in the container. All right, well, what do we have here? Weight equals mass times gravity. So in this case it's going to be 4.8 kilograms multiplied by 10 meters per second, so negative 2, which is 48 kilograms. Now what's important, here I'm using g equals oops, 10 meters per second. Why? Because it's defined as that in this exam. Let's go up to the start. I want to talk about this. Here we go. There. I'm not using it because I think it's right. It's not. It's like 9.8. Here we go though. It's telling me to use the value for gravity as 10. That's where it comes from. So it's always worth having a quick look at the start to see if there's anything that's tremendously important to use. In this exam paper, it lists the value of gravity to be 10 at the start, and that's generally the case for the CIE IGCSE exams. So like for physics. Right, two, the pressure due to the liquid on the base of the container. Now, I wonder how many of you saw the mistake I've made there? If not, look very closely at the answer to question 3-1. Look closely, find the error, you've got three seconds. Three, two, one. Oops. Weight is measured in newtons. There we are. I just defaulted to kilograms there, that's a bit of a mistake. Now, the pressure due to the liquid on the base of the container. Okay. Pressure, always write down the equations you're using. It was force over area. Well, we have a force from the container, it's 48 newtons. The area of the base of the container is 0 0.12 meters times 0 0.16 meters, which will give me a value of 2500 pascals. Explain why the total pressure on the base of the container is greater than the value calculated in A2? Well, because you've got all the stuff in a container and the entire weight of the atmosphere above it, which is like two cars worth of weight. So, there's also atmospheric pressure. The depth of the liquid in the container is 0 0.32 meters. Calculate the density of the liquid. All right. Well, density, and again, we'll write down the equation we're using. It's good practice. Density equals mass over volume. 
which equals 4.8 kilograms for the question, divided by a volume, which is 0 0.12 meters times 0 0.16 meters times 0 0.32 meters that we've just been given, which will give us 781 kilograms meters negative three. All right, so the density, I'm just going to do it to two significant figures because everything here is two significant figures, which will give me 780 kilograms meters, oops, negative three. There we go. All right, next one, four. Describe the movement of molecules in a solid. So in a solid, the molecules vibrate about fixed positions. And in a gas, well, describe movement molecules in a gas, the molecules move about randomly and at high speeds. There we go. Next one, a closed box contained with gas molecules. Explain in terms of momentum how the molecules exert pressure on the walls of the box. Ooh, it's a tricky question, that one. All right. So let's use a technique that I have for answering long answer questions. Something happens which has an effect, which means therefore. Uh, something happens which has an effect, which means therefore. So you can squeeze it all in, I guess. Something happens. Well, the molecules are going to collide with the walls of the box, which has an effect. Well, the molecules have a change of momentum, which means well, this will produce a force, or a force must be produced for this to happen. And the force is given by the change in momentum divided by the change in time. So we've got force acting in the molecules. Now if we've got force acting in the molecules, so something happens which has an effect, which means, so we're still in which means, but from Newton's third law, If there's a force acting on the molecules, then there's an equal and opposite force acting on the walls of the box. So something happens which has an effect, which means therefore. Well, therefore we have a force acting on the walls of the box and we're interested in pressure. Well, pressure equals force over area. As pressure equals force over area, the molecules exert a pressure on the walls of the box. There we go, pretty succinct, pretty well defined answer. I still couldn't fit it in all the lines that they gave me. One, two, three, four, five, six lines they gave me, I needed seven. Um, don't worry if you go off the lines, as long as you're putting it all in the same area, it should be absolutely fine. Obviously, Go through and answer the easy questions first. Don't spend ages trying to do something for uh, four marks like that when there's maybe 50 marks in the rest of the paper that you need to get that are more important. So always go through a paper and do the easy questions first. All right, let's look at the next question. Question number five. A ray of light is incident on a glass block. The light changes direction. State the name of this effect. Well, it's refracted refraction. The cause of this effect, well, light travels more slowly in the block. It changes speed and changes direction. So it changes direction because it changes speed. B, figure 5.1, drawn to full size or full scale, shows a thin converging lens of focal length 3.5 centimeters. All right, I'll have to move a bit further down and see what I want us to do with it. Mark each of the two principal focuses and label each with an F. Okay, well, what's it tell us about the focal length? Ah, focal length 3.5 centimeters. And if we jump down, each small square of five little blocks is one centimeter, so 3.5. That's one centimeter two centimetres, three centimetres, three and a half centimetres, label that with an F. On the other side, one, two, 
three three and a half centimeters we'll label that with an F okay so we've done the first task an object O of height 4.4 centimeters is placed a distance of 7.5 centimeters from the lens and that's already been drawn on on figure 5.1 draw the rays from the tip of the object O to locate the image draw and label the image all right so the two main ones we're going to work with one the very top one over here and coming down through that full glance I'm just going to continue on there we go that should be fine I'm going to draw from the top, obviously, down to the focal length on the same side. There we go. And along to where they all meet. Alright, so now I have to draw and label the image. Let's do that. There we go. Beautiful drawing. Wonderful. Now let's see what the next question is. Determine the height of the image. Well, thankfully, because it's got a scale on the graph, I can just count it up. Uh, one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. Four centimeters would actually be here. So that's 3.8 centimeters. Now, don't worry if you did that and got 3.9 or 4 or 4.1. There's a range of answers that are acceptable for that type of question. All right, stay and explain whether the image is real or virtual. Well, in this case, it's actually a real image because it can be projected. All of the refracted rays meet at a point. There we go. Question 6. Figure 6.1 shows wavefronts approaching a gap in the barrier. A1, draw three wave fronts to the right of the barrier. Okay, well, first of all, of course, we're going to have that one. Then we're going to start seeing things spread out in a semicircular way. Quite tricky to draw these little things. And we have to do three because it asks us to do three. There we go. All right. We see it spreading out very nicely like that. So three wave fronts to the right of the barrier, check. Now here we've got a gap in the barrier, increase to five times the gap. Okay, draw three wave fronts to the right of the barrier. A bit more tricky, so let's do this. So you still have this central one, one, oops, be a bit too big, a bit too far out there, but two, we're trying to keep them the same distance apart. Three, there we go. And what you'll see is that these all have an edge to them. The main bit we're interested in, of course, oops, is the centre bit. There we are. So we have a nice clear centre section there. B. Describe with a labelled diagram an experiment using water waves that shows the reflection of wave fronts that occur at a straight barrier. Is pull out some kind of a barrier and put some water, we're going to have a wave generator, we're going to create waves that will bounce off the barrier. All right, in order to make this visible, we're going to want to, let's just set this up. Got the barrier here. There we are. Excellent. Barrier there. Put a wave generator here, which is a stick. Wave generator, which is a wooden rod. We have an oscillating wooden rod. There we are, oscillating up and down. So this entire section here will be water. And as we have a whole bunch of water, we're going to need some form of water containment vessel, plastic tub. All right, and what we're going to want is, well, that's a pretty large plastic tub, isn't it?
wooden rod glued to edge. It's had to come down, so there's only one way it can come in. There we are, so these are the barriers. This wooden rod glued to the edge is also a barrier. This one up here is a barrier. We have our plane waves being created. You want to of course try oops. Keep it roughly flat. Now what I like to do with this kind of thing is just draw it first and then because I'll be doing it in pencil, pull out an eraser. There we go. So I'm not losing time trying to get everything just perfect. You never get things just perfect. You can get them pretty good and pretty good's not bad. There we are. I'm not getting overly complicated in this. I just want to make sure that the stuff I'm putting down is right. we have our reflected waves okay and I think our final point the waves can either be observed by eye or using a video camera it could easily just be a phone on a video setting there we go excellent job done Question seven, state in terms of the structure why metals are good conductors of electricity. Well, metals have a large amount of free electrons which are able to move around the uh, positively charged metal ions, able to freely move. Oh. The electrons can move easily. B, a cylindrical metal wire, W1, of length L and cross-sectional area A, has a resistance of 16 ohms. A second cylindrical wire, W2, having length L over 2 and cross-sectional area 2A, is made from the same metal. Determine the resistance of W2. All right. Well, what do we know about resistance? Resistance is proportional to L over A. In fact, specifically equals this uh, resistivity constant multiplied by L over A. Here we are. Now, what we're doing is we're taking the length. So resistance 1 equals rho times L over A. Resistance 2 equals rho times L, which is L over 2, divided by the area, which is now 2A. So R2 equals rho L over 4 a, which if you compare R1 and R2, here and here, there we go, you'll see that that's actually R1 over 4. So, the resistance of W2 then is 16 ohms divided by 4, which is then 4 ohms. There we go. Now, Calculate the effective resistance of W1 and W2 when connected in parallel. All right, let's draw this out. What we have circle like that. Oops, there we go. We have 16 ohms and we have 4 ohms. And what do we know? We know that 1 over RT in this sort of situation is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, which will then give us 1 over RT equals 1 over 16 plus 1 over 4, which is actually 5 over 16. So 1 over RT equals 5 over 16. That means RT equals 16 over 5, which is 3.2 ohms. So the resistance of the parallel pair is 3.2 ohms. The parallel pair of resistors in B2 is connected to a battery that's made from three cells in series, each of electromotive force 
E, there is a current in each resistor. State the EMF of the battery. All right, well, they're connected in series. So it's just uh, E plus E plus E. That's 3E. And that happens because basically what you've got here is E, E, E. It's three cells in series, and you end up with a total voltage of E plus E plus E. There we are. That's why that happens. The current in the battery is IB. The current in W1 is I1. The current in W2 is I2. Place a tick in the box to indicate how these three currents are related. All right, so we've got our EMF source. You know what? I'm just going to draw that as that. There we go. We've got a current coming through there of IB. That then splits into two sections. We've got W1, W2. We've got 16 ohms and Three point oh, that's sixteen ohms and four ohms. All right. This is sixteen ohms, and this is four ohms. Now we want to find out where the current is biggest. We've got a current in here and a current in here. We call this I of double oh uh, I two. There we go. And this one up here, I one. Well, I one has 16 ohms resistance. That's a pretty big resistance. I2 has only 4 ohms resistance to go through. So, as they've got the same voltage across from V, and I equals V over R, what you'll find is that I2 is quite large because it's uh, V over 4. I1 is quite small because it's V over 16. So what we have is the smallest is I1, next largest is I2, and IB is I1 plus I2. So we're actually looking here. There we go. 8. In a laboratory at normal room temperature, 200 grams of water is poured into a beaker. A thermometer placed in the water has a reading of 22 degrees C. Small pieces of ice at zero degrees C are placed into the water one by one. The mixture is stirred after each addition until the ice is melted and the process is continued until the temperature recorded by thermometer is zero degrees Celsius. The total mass of ice added to the water is found to be 60 grams. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Uh, calculate the thermal energy lost by the water originally in the beaker. Right, okay. So what it's saying is, you put in that much water at 22 degrees Celsius, it gets colder. It goes from 22 to 0 degrees Celsius. How much water, or how much energy, sorry, has it lost to its uh, immediate surroundings? In this case, the ice. All right, so what do we know? We know that E equals mc delta t, or delta theta, it doesn't really matter. Mass, this is uh, grams per degree Celsius. So we go with the mass is 200 grams times... 4.2 joules. All right, so that gives us 200 grams times 4.2 joules per gram per degree Celsius multiplied by 22 degrees Celsius, which gives us a value of 18480 joules. There we go. Now, looking at these, what we seem to see are an awful lot of there's two significant figures. So when we put our final answer in, let's put it to two significant figures gives us a thermal energy of 18,000 joules. There we are. B. A small the thermal energy lost by the water is originally in the beakers transferred to the ice. Calculate specific heat, latent heat of fusion of the ice. Now, what we want to know then is how much energy is needed per gram to turn the ice into water. And we have 1 8 480 joules of energy, which is being shared equally among 60 grams of ice, and that is enough to turn it into water. So that gives us 308 joules per gram, 
And of course, because we're doing it to two significant figures, we'll record that as 310 joules per gram. Now, suggest a reason for any inaccuracy in the value of the specific latent heat of fusion of ice calculated in B. Assume the temperature readings in the values for the mass of the water and the mass of the ice are accurate. OK, well, heat transfer from the surroundings is a good one. Now, saying heat transfer from surroundings is not to surroundings because 22 degrees Celsius is a reasonable amount for room temperature. As you get lower and lower, as it does down to zero degrees, you're unlikely to be in a room at zero degrees Celsius doing the experiment. 9. A student wants to demagnetise a permanent bar magnet. She suggests three steps. 1. Place the magnet in a long coil. 2. Switch on an, a large alternating current in the coil. 3. Switch off the current. 4. Remove the bar from the coil. State and explain whether she uh, these steps will be able to demagnetise the magnet. Well, they won't. And they won't because of... Where are we? This step here. If you want to demagnetize a magnet, you have a, an alternating current in a coil, put a magnet in a coil, and you slowly withdraw it with the current on. You turn that current off, and it's not going to be constantly jostling the magnetic field of the iron bar inside. So the answer is no, the alternating current should not be switched off, and the magnet should be removed from the coil. B. Figure 9.1 shows a coil supplied with a current using a split ring commutator. There we are. Excellent. Nice little DC motor there. Stay and explain any motion of the coil. OK. Well, let's look at this. What we have is a current inside the circuit. There we are. It's going in this direction from the large end of the battery round to the small end. Coming up through here. In this direction. Through the wire. Uh, coming back in the other direction course ultimately back down through the left hand side and back into the other side of the battery. All right so what does that mean? Well you've got a current inside a, a magnetic field is going to experience a force if we use Fleming's left hand rule then what we see is there's going to experience a force downwards at this side And a force upwards at this side producing clockwise motion. So let's write that down. So what happens the coil will turn and it's going to turn in the clockwise direction. Now if you look at the slip rings they're there to change the direction of the current in the coil and that happens about every half turn. So the current reverses direction every half turn in the coil, and because of that, the coil will continue to turn clockwise. Right, two, the coil in figure 9.1 in the, the picture of the DC motor consists of three tons of wire. The magnetic field strength uh, of the wire is M, with a current of two amps in the coil. The coil experiences a turning effect T. OK, now the question looks like, what happens when we change the current or the magnetic field strength? All right, if we put four times the current, then what we're going to have is four times the magnetic field of the wire. The magnetic field strength here is the magnetic field strength of the magnet, not the wire. So we're going to end up with four times the turning effect, 4T. If we change it to six tons, but keep the coil the same, well, we've doubled the magnetic field. That's going to be 2T. And if number of tons remains the same, current and current the coil remains the same, but we drop the magnetic field strength by half, then there's half the turning effect, T over 2. Right, 10A. Explain why the voltage of the power supply uh, to the primary coil of a transformer must be alternating. All right, well, we need to create an alternating magnetic field in the core to induce an alternating current in the secondary coil. There we go, so we have to create that alternating magnetic field in the core to induce the alternating current in the secondary coil. Very important one to induce. There are 8,000 tons in a primary coil of a transformer. The primary coil is connected to a 240 volt main supply, a 6 volt lamp, 
is connected to the secondary coil and operates at full brightness. Calculate the number of tons in the secondary coil. All right, well, what do we have? V1 over V2 equals N1 over N2. Let's follow that through. We have 240 volts over 6 volts equals 8,000 tons under a mysterious N2 number of tons in the secondary coil. So we rearrange that, and what we're going to get is N2 equals 6 times 8,000 divided by 240, which will give us 200 tons. There we are. The current in the lamp is 2 amps. The transformer operates with 100% efficiency. Calculate the current in the primary coil. Alright, what we're going to do is we're going to power equals current times voltage. Power equals current times voltage. Now, what we want to do is find the power on the one side, on the output side, the, the secondary side. And then we're going to take the information we have from the power and apply the same equation to the primary side. So what do we mean? Well, There we go, we know it's 12 watts on the primary or on the secondary circuit, so it's also 12 watts on the primary circuit. Power in equals power out. Okay, so if we wanted to find the circuit 2, that equals current times voltage is 12 watts which means the current equals 12 volts all over 240 volts, which is 0 0.05 amps. The primary circuit contains a 2 amp fuse. Calculate the maximum number of lamps identical to the lamp above that can be connected in parallel in the secondary circuit without blowing the fuse. OK, so we've got 2 amps in total. We're using 0.05, how many times can we do that? That's 2 amps divided by 0.05 amps, and what we can have is 40. That will give us 40 lamps we can have. Right, question 11, read on 222, is radioactive. It can be represented as 22286. For a neutral atom of read on 222, states the number of protons. Well, for that we use the proton number, 86. The number of neutrons is 222 minus 86 and the number of electrons because it's neutral is exactly the same as the number of protons 86 am i finished no because i need an answer here and that answer is given by 136 neutrons all right a read on 222 nucleus decays by alpha emission to polonium nucleus complete the equation well we know there's an alpha particle and an alpha particle is two protons and four nucleons. Uh, two protons and two neutrons together. Four nucleons. All right. Now, we know there's also a polonium nucleus. We know that charge is conserved. So I'm, I've got two. I need 86. I'm missing 84. And we also know that the number of nucleons is conserved. I have four. I need 222. I'm missing 218. Now we go 218 plus 4 gives me 222. 84 plus 2 gives me 86. C, read on 222, has a half-life of 3.8 days. At a certain time, a sample contains 6.4 times 10 to the 6 radon nuclei. Calculate the number of alpha particles emitted by the radon nuclei in the following 7.6 days. Ooh, a trick to that question. It's not asking how many particles are left. It's asking how many have decayed. Each one throws, each decay throws out an alpha particle, it's asking how many have decayed. So, if we apply the half-lives, it will tell us how many is left. We have to then take the total and subtract the number left to find out how many have decayed. So we've been told 7.6 days, well that's two half-lives. So on the first half-life, I go from 6.4 times 10 to the 6 nuclei. In the first half life, I go from 6.4 times 10 to the 6 nuclei, and I will end up with 3.2 times 10 to the 6. Uh, 
on the second half life I go from 3.2 times 10 to the 6 and I will end up with 1.6 times 10 to the 6 all right so the question is now how many have decayed and the answer to that is 6.4 times 10 to the 6 nuclei minus 1.6 times 10 to the 6 nuclei which tells me that there's 4.8 times 10 to the 6 nuclei that have decayed which tells me that there's 4.8 times 10 to the 6 alpha particles released always watch out for these little tricks that they sometimes put into questions so 4.8 times 10 to the 6 alpha particles released there we go well done good job I hope you enjoyed that video if you did feel free to like and subscribe I'm going to be uploading a, a whole bunch of past exam papers that I'm working through obviously to try and help people come up to the uh, exam period so if you've got any requests, anything you'd particularly like me to run through, feel free to leave a, a comment in the comment section below. Have a lovely day.